nothing compares, Lord. Nothing compares to the promise that we have in you. And Lord, we just want to sing, we just want to shout that we love you, Lord. And it's the cry of each and every one of us here this morning, Lord, that we want to touch from you. We want to touch your throne. We want to declare our love. We want to surrender our lives to you, Lord. Lord, look at us, Lord. Each and every one of us, our hearts are open before you. Lord, take it, mold it, refine it. Help us, Lord, to truly love you. Help us, Lord, to be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we just surrender our lives to you. And this morning, Lord, we give you the permission, Lord, to change our lives, to shake whatever there needs to be shaken in our lives. Lord, we give you that permission, Lord. And then you just shake our lives and make us more and more like your son. Make us more and more like you. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us unto your hands. Holy Spirit, may you continue your work in our lives. Lord, we also want to commit, Lord, the rest of the time unto your hands. May you continue to speak to us, Lord, to the rest of the service, to the message that will be preached, to the worship songs that will be sung, to the testimonies that we will hear. Lord, may you continually speak to us, Lord. And you, may you bless that our tithes and our offerings, whatever that we give to you, Lord, may you bless it for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning once again, church. Yes, it's a wonderful morning. Uh, we are continuing in our series again on the Do or Die series. And basically it's based on uh, the book of James that says, Work without, I mean, faith without works is dead. And so if we continue to, from the perspective of our faith, if we don't put our faith into action, we don't start doing things for our faith, it's actually a date faith. And so from the, from the perspective of faith, it's actually a do or die circumstances, situation. And so uh, this series is all based on the disciples' pledge that we have uh, come out with a ch- as a church, uh, disciples that, that we as a church, we want to see that every one of us start practicing in our lives. And so do take out your sermon note with me as we recite the disciple pledge again we're going to do this for the entire of this series the back of your sermon notes is the disciples pledge so all of you take out your sermon notes turn to the back and let's stand together all of us let's stand together and recite our disciples pledge together all right together with one voice in unity therefore as jesus christ disciples in wesley methodist church malacca we aspire to commit ourselves to attend corporate worship weekly, cultivate a consistent quiet time, to participate in a discipleship group, to serve in at least one church ministry, and to participate in outreach, to tithe faithfully and give cheerfully, generously and systematically, to share our faith habitually and intentionally, to grow deeper in knowledge of God, to glow increasingly in outward holiness and to bear fruit progressively in inward holiness. And may God bless us to keep our pledge. Please be seated. Well, friends, as I said, you know, we are continuing our series of Do or Die. And in this series, uh, it says it's about putting our faith into practice. You know, putting things in our faith uh, that we know of but putting it into practice. And back to the, what I was sharing in the first introduction of this service, in this, in this, ser- of this series, I shared about how often, you know, we know a lot, but we just do so little of what we actually know. I mean, we know a lot about forgiveness, that we need to forgive. But when someone hurts us so badly, we just can't forgive. We know all that, that we have to control our anger, that we should not lose our temper needlessly. But when someone just strikes us in the wrong, poke, poke us wrongly or say something that, that, that steals or something in us, we just lose all constraint and we lose our temper. And temptation, when temptation just comes through our way, you know, we know we shouldn't do it, we know we mustn't do it, but yet 
we just fall into temptation. And there's this huge barrier between knowing and actually doing. And for some reason, we just can't flip that switch from knowing to doing. We just can't cross that chasm. We just can't cross that barrier from knowing to doing. And how many of you feel like that all, all the time? I mean, how, how do you feel like that some of the time? That you just find yourself unable to do. You know you have to do, but you just can't do it. How many of you feel like that most of the time? None of the time. All of you are very good. Uh, how many of you feel like that? Yes, there are some honest people around. You know, and you, for, it's good news. You're not alone. You're not the only one that feels like that. In fact, the Apostle Paul feels exactly like that. You're not in bad company. Okay, let me read to you what Paul says in Romans 7 verse 18. Let me read again to you. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. How many can identify with that verse? The good I desire to do, I long to do, I want to do, but I just don't do it. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, I mustn't do, yet that is what I do. How many of you can identify with that? And why is it like that? Why are we like that? Why, do, why, why, why does Paul struggle with that? Why do we struggle with it? Well, let's, Paul gives us the answer in verse 22. Let's read this all together up on the screen. Verse 22, Romans 7, 22, all out loud. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Other than the words law and members, do you have any, any idea what Paul is saying? I mean, honestly, you know, can, you, can, you, can you understand what he's saying? I tell you, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to understand this guy. All right, and I know we, are, we, are, we, just, we, we have difficulty understanding. So I'm going to illustrate to you what, Paul is, what the whole thing Paul is trying to say. And to do that, once again, I need three male volunteers. Okay, and as usual, uh, we'll look for someone in the back. I, 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 I won't punish the front people, those who like to sit at the back. And uh, Helen, right? Last week, uh, Richard volunteered you, right? You want to volunteer him or not? You want, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> Go to the front first, huh? Okay, and who else can we have? Let's go, lah. Let's go further back all the way, lah. Mr. Tay, right? Did you, thank you for volunteering. Okay, I meet you in the front. And who else do we have here? Uh, all looking very scared. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name, my dear brother. Tio. Tio. Yes, Mr. Tio, come forward, thanks. Okay, so I have my three, three volunteers here. Okay, please, uh, up on the stage, up on the stage. Don't be shy. Okay, all right, uh, just stand over here first. Okay, all three of you over here. Just stand aside here first. Okay, friends, you know we are on the side here, Mr. Tio. Okay, all of us are made up of three parts in our book. We are made out of three parts. We are tripart human beings. And the first part that we have is what we call the body or the flesh. Okay, Mr. T come, come, you stand here. All right, let's say this is the body. All right, this is the flesh, the body, or what we normally call the carnal man. And in this guy, is where all the desires, you know, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the desire to sin, the desire for the world, all these reside in this fellow here, all right? Okay. And we have what we call the soul. All right, in other words, come Richard, here over here. This is our soul, okay? Our soul is basically our mind, the, our intellect, our personality, our mind, but mainly our mind. It consists primarily of our mind. And in here is where all our knowledge lies. We know that we have to do this. We know this. We know that. We know the Bible. Everything lies here. This is the, the, and he's the one that decides what to do. Whether do I do this or do I not do this? This is where it is in the mind, in the soul. And we have what we call the spirit. All right? And this is our spirit. And the spirit, in the spirit is where the desire, 
to follow God, the longing to be close to God, to draw near to God. All those lies in the spirit. And so we are made out of three parts, body, mind, body, soul, and spirit, or body, mind, carnal man, spirit man, and our mind. Okay? And so what happens is, there's always a tug of war. There's always a... Okay, you grab his hand, you grab his hand, and you pull, both of you pull him apart. All right? There's always this tug of war for control over the mind. The flesh wants the mind to follow him. And the spirit wants the flesh, to fo- the mind, to follow him. And there's always this struggle. And that's what Paul is saying. I struggle. There's two laws working in me. There's two laws that are struggling in me. And there's these two laws here. Now, this is what happened. Before we became Christians, when we were first born into this world, okay, because of sin in the world, because we are born in sin, our spirit man is dead, all right? Dead, die. You are dead, okay? Uh, cut off, okay? He's dead, all right? He's dead. So what happened is, our soul only has the carnal man. And so our soul is in complete control of the carnal man. So you stand over, stand in front of him. All right, okay, just stand like that, okay. So it's as though there is no longer two people, but one. So because they are just so in tune, because there's no spirit to fight, so our soul is completely in subject to the carnal man. Hold his hands. Hold, hold his hands. And so whatever the carnal man wants, the carnal man wants to move up, the soul will just follow. The carnal man says, move left, he'll just follow. He's complete in tune with the carnal man. It's as though they're just one person. Then suddenly, you accepted Christ. Suddenly, you became a Christian. Okay, for whatever reason, huh, you became a Christian. And suddenly, the spirit is now alive again. The spirit is now alive, and so the, can- the soul is no longer completely under the control of the carnal man. It's maybe uh, 80% under the carnal man, and your spirit is now trying to pull him back, trying to get control over the soul, over the mind. And as so you can see, there's always this struggle going on. They're always trying to struggle for control over your mind, over your, I mean, your thinking, your personality. There's always this struggle. And a lot of times, you see, when we, when, when we first became a Christian, our spirit man is actually very weak. Okay? He's just, just, just barely alive. You know, it's like you uh, go to, you know, you watch, hospi- you watch television show, uh, people, uh, they go to the hospital, ER or something like that, and they are dying, lying there, and then suddenly they died. Heart stopped, dead already. All right? So he was dead. Then suddenly the doctors come and bzz, 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 and then suddenly the machine, tick, tick, he's alive again, but barely alive, still on life support, barely clinging. So that's your spirit, man. All right? He's like that. He's barely alive, barely clinging. And so we have a very weak spirit man, and we have a very strong carnal man. So the carnal man has very much control over the spirit. And the only time, and every time when, let's say, you come across a situation, you want to do something according to the spirit. You know that, that God says, okay, uh, you should not lose your temper, okay? Let's say maybe your, your wife did something to you, very angry, you want to scold her. And because of that, your spirit man will say, hey, don't lie, cannot, you must love her. But the carnal man will say, go it, she deserves it. And because of that, but the spirit man is so weak, he will just follow, follow the carnal man. So what our objective as Christians, our target is we want the carnal man to be actually, we want to discipline this guy. We can never get rid of this guy. Until the day we die, the flesh will always be with us. But we want to discipline him. We want to punish him. We want to put him in his place so that he instead will be so weak and our spirit our spirit, our soul will be in sole control of our spirit man. That whatever the spirit desires, our soul will follow. Whatever our spirit longs for, our soul will immediately follow. Flows. And that is what we want. But unfortunately for many of us, this guy is just too weak. And we are mostly under the control of our carnal man. Even though we are Christians, because this guy's on life support, he's barely alive. All right, thank you very much, brothers. You can sit down. Okay, so you can see there's always a constant battle between our carnal man and our spirit man for the control of our mind. And so the question is who will win? Who wins this battle? Who wins this tug of war? Very simple answer the one you feed the most. The one you strengthen, the one you invest in, the one you feed, that's the one that will become stronger and that's the one that will win. So you know what I mean? The first point of your notes is this. In order to overcome our carnal man, we need to strengthen 
our spirit man. We need to strengthen him. You know, there's no, no two ways about it. You need to strengthen your spirit man. But, uh, but the problem is for many of us, like I said, when we first became Christian, our spirit man is just so weak. It's alive, yes. It's alive, but it's on life support. It's barely breathing. It's barely alive. And for many of us, after we become a Christian, we do nothing to feed the spirit man. We do nothing. And so it continues on life support. It remains on life support for many, 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 many years. And we wonder to ourselves, why is it that my life is no different? Huh? Why is it that I'm still like the world? Why is it I say I'm a Christian, but I still I, I don't see any difference in my life? Well, it's because we never feed, we never strengthen the spirit man. And we've only been feeding the carnal man, and we've never strengthened the spirit man. You see, friends, when you have a weak spirit man, you will be easily overcome by the world. You'll be easily overcome by the world. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, you know, you will easily enter into temptation. Because although the spirit wants to, but the flesh is in control. Or in other words, in verse Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, when you strengthen the spirit man, when your spirit man is strong, and when you invest in your spirit man, then your spirit, then you will not walk in the lust of the flesh. But the problem for many of us, we don't. Our spirit is on life support, and that's why we flow easily to the ways of the flesh. You know? And so when problems arise in life, when difficulties come, when the world brings its challenges and its pressures into us, we easily succumb to the world because our spirit man is just so weak. It doesn't even have the strength to influence our soul at all. Once in a while, we may hear a little voice. Once in a while, we may get a little tuck in our hearts. But other than that, our spirit man has completely no control over our soul. And, because, and so we just fall into the ways of the world, into the challenge. We just succumb to the temptations of the world. And that's why many times, you know, for sometimes husbands, you know, fathers, when the going gets tough, when things become so bad in the family, and you just feel like walking out of that family, you just feel like giving it up. And although you know that you shouldn't, but because you have never invested in your spirit man, your spirit man is on life support, and when that problems arise, you just find no strength but to just walk out of that marriage, to just walk out of that family. Sometimes, you know, when you, husbands, when you go traveling, and when you go traveling and you're away from the home, and suddenly a pretty little thing comes knocking on the hotel door, and you struggle and say, no, I shouldn't. But because you have a spirit man that is on life support, you will find no strength and you just succumb. To the temptations of the world, whether it be the temptation for money, for ambition, for, uh, for, for worldly values, whatever it is, you will succumb to the temptations of the world. And some of us are facing it right now. Some of you are struggling right now with the pressures and the challenges of the world. And you find yourself unable to break free. You know you shouldn't succumb, but yet you find unable to. You need to strengthen your spirit man. And secondly, a weak spirit man will also cause us to follow the wisdom of the world. We'll follow the, our soul will follow the wisdom. In other words, you will follow the way the world thinks. Your mind cannot operate and, and, and look at things through the eyes of the spirit. You know, that's why the Romans 5, 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh, those whose carnal man is strong, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, who invest and souls and nourishes the Spirit man, the things of the Spirit. In other words, friends, your minds will follow whoever is stronger. And if your carnal man is the one that's in control over your life, in control over your mind, when you look at the world, your outlook of life will all be according to the ways of the flesh, the ways of the world. You will never be able to see God in anything. And that's why even though God may be doing a work in your life, you just can't see it. Even though God may be doing some miraculous things in your life, you just can't see it. Even though God may be bringing challenges and bringing promises into your life, you just can't see it because your mind is controlled, is, is your lens, you're looking through the lens of the flesh. But when you have your strong spirit man, and when you face problems, when trials come and temptation comes, when circumstances arise and you look through the lens of the spirit, you will see God's promises. You will see God's love. You will see God's protection. You will see God's plans in all of those. The difference is just the way we see things. And we have a, it depends on which 
man is stronger, our spirit man or our carnal man. And you know what's the worst thing? When you're on this side, when your carnal man is completely control of you, you won't even know that, you, that, you, that he is in control. You will think that you're very spiritual. Because this are the, one of the lies of the carnal man is that you are spiritual, you are holy, you don't need to strengthen your spirit man, you don't need to invest in him. And those are the lies of the enemy. And he wants you to keep on believing it. And if you are over that side and the carnal man is fully control of your soul, that's what you will believe and you won't even realize that you are there. And that's why some people, they can come to church week after week, they can hear a sermon and the sermon will just shoot past by them and then nothing happens to their life. They can read the Word of God and the Word of God can be so plain and clear to them and yet nothing happens in their life because their minds are no longer, their minds are completely clouded by the carnal man. And so, friends, that's why Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. If we have a carnal mind, it will never be subject to the law of God. And so the question then this morning is this, how do we strengthen the spirit man? We, want, we know we need a strong spirit man, and we want to strengthen it. How do we strengthen it? Well, which brings me to the next point in your notes. Practice the three R's daily. Practice the three R's daily. What is that? I'll explain what the three R's later. But it's basically talking about our devotions. It's doing our quiet time and our devotion, spending time with the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and letting the Word of God infuse us, and letting the Word of God speak to our lives, and responding to God through His Word. You see, friends, and what's important is we have to do it daily. You see, is this. Many of us, okay, we know that the, the food of the Spirit is the Word of God. That's the food of the Spirit. That's how we nourish the Spirit. But many of us, the problem with many of us is we think that as long as I come to church once a week and I hear a sermon once a week, my spirit is being nourished. Let me ask you this. If I only give you um, one meal a week, how do you think you will survive, any of you? Can any of you survive on one meal a week? You can't. And likewise, friends, it's not enough. You know, coming to, to, to service on Sunday and hearing the word on Sunday is just an appetizer. It's just uh, uh, maybe a, 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 a special meal. But we need to feed on the Word of God daily. Our spirit needs to feed on the Word of God daily. And that is why many people, they, we call ourselves Christians, but we behave exactly like the world. Because we think that as long as I come to church once a week, I get a little bit of food which doesn't, do any, which doesn't nourish me enough, and I go back to the world, I'm fine. But in reality, our spirit man is in life support. It's on life support. It's malnourished and it's on life support. And we behave exactly like the world because our carnal man is in full control of the way we think, the way we behave, the way we walk. And that's why, friends, it's not enough to just come to church on Sunday. And that's why we need to do our daily devotions. We need to come to the Word of God daily and we need to be fed by the Word of God daily. Why? Because our carnal man is being fed daily. Do you know that? Do you know that our carnal man is being fed, he's being strengthened, he's being, uh, he's, he's being fed 24-7. You know, it's like he has a free buffet line every waking hour, every waking moment. Our carnal man has a free buffet line and he's getting fatter and fatter and fatter and you have a real obese carnal man. And that's the reality. Because every time in the world, when, as long as we are in the world, we are bombarded by things of the world which in fact feeds our carnal man. We are bombarded by the values of the world. We are bombarded by the, the thoughts of the world, the things that the world sees as important. We are bombarded by all these things day in, day night. And it, it just feeds our carnal man. And if you're not careful, you know, he will get fatter and fatter and fatter and our spirit man gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. You know, the things you watch on TV, the novels you read, the things you do at work, your dealings with your community, with the people in the world, when you're talking to them, when you watch the news, when you read the newspaper, all these are feeding our carnal men with the values of the world. You know, in fact, nobody is spared nowadays. In fact, recently, I think about three years back, when my daughter was four years old, her first kindergarten, not our kindergarten here, another kindergarten, and they, they were having a kindergarten concert, you know, children have a concert, and she was, they have a concert and she was, the concert is supposed to dance according to a song. And the song was, you know the song, uh, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world, you know that song? Anyone heard of that song? 
And so she heard, she, so every day she'll come back and she'll be singing, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world, and she'll be singing that. And I'll be wondering, what is that song? Huh? I know I've heard of the song, and I went to look at the lyrics of the song, which my girl will be singing and humming to herself. Let me read to you, four-year-old, and this is what they teach them, what they are bombarded with. I am a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life in plastic is fantastic. You can brush my hair and dress me everywhere. Four years old. And they're, they're singing there, you can brush my hair, you can undress me everywhere. Later on, I'm a blonde bimbo girl in a fantasy world. Dress me up, make it tight, I'm your dolly. Four years old, this is what we're teaching them. Kiss me here, touch me there, hanky panky. You can touch, you can play if you say I'm always yours. Imagine, when my girl grows up, a guy and come and says, you are always mine. They say, you can touch me anywhere, you can, you can, you can uh, play with me anywhere. That's what happens. Make me walk, make me talk, do whatever you please. I can act like a star, I can back on my knees. And this is the lyrics of a song, and this is what we are bombarding our children with, and this is what the world is bombarding us with. Every time we go out into the world, that's what we get. We are bombarded with the values of the world. We are bombarded with the, with the, with the value systems of the world, the things that, the, things that, is so, that, that, that seems so harmless. I mean, it's just a song, children dancing to a song. What's so harmless about that? But what it does is actually feeding our carnal man. It's feeding the carnal man, so we can't avoid it. Unless, unless you go and run away and live in a high mountain all by yourself, you can't avoid the things in the world. I mean, like for instance, for instance myself, that day I was in, with my wife, we were walking in a shopping complex. We were walking, and then suddenly, uh, you know, in the shopping complex, they play music, right? So you listen to some of the music they play, and there was this song, I kind of like it, like when I was young, I quite listened to this song also. Engelberg Humperdinck, Please Release Me. All of you old ones know this song, right? And imagine I was just listening to the tune and then I was walking harmlessly. Then after the song had stopped, the tune still still plays in my mind. I was just singing there, like, please release me. And then I'm looking at holding my hands wife, my, my wife's hand, and say, please release me, let me go, for I don't love you anymore. I was thinking, what am I singing? <laughs> what am I singing? I'm standing here, I'm walking with my wife, I'm holding her hand, and I'm saying, please release me, I don't love you anymore. I mean, but that's what happens, that's what the world does. It bombards you, and before you know it, it feeds your carnal man, it feeds it. And so there's so many other things. It's not just songs, you know. Oh, by the way, it's about songs also. I think we're talking about songs. Uh. Do you know, uh, for those of you who are my dad's age and above, uh, in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, you know most of your songs are all very melancholy, one or not? All the pop songs that you all listen to, no wonder that age, uh, that generation, they always, they, they always talk about uh, melancholy, talk about suicide, they talk about breakup and things like that. I mean, just look at the songs you all listen to those, those days. It's, it's like uh, Skeeter Davis, he sings a song and say, what? It's the end of the world because the boyfriend left him, it's the end of the world. And songs like, uh, all, the, all the songs is either the boyfriend left him, I want to commit suicide or I want to die or something like that. Right? And that's why you have a very melancholy age at that time, because it feeds society. And likewise today, the songs out there in the world is all about sex, it's all about free love, it's all about loose living, and it feeds the carnal man today. And so we need to be careful. I'm not saying that we can't listen to those songs. I'm not saying that we need to take ourselves out of the world, no. But what I'm saying is you can't avoid the carnal man from being fed. But what you need to do is you need to feed the spirit man. And it's not just about songs. When you go to schools, for example, and your teachers are teaching things, you know, sometimes the, what the teachers teach us, they, they are teaching materials, yes, but they are also imparting worldly values, whether we realize it or not. They are imparting through the way they talk, through the way they behave, they are imparting worldly values, values of promotions, values of money, values of ambitions, and these are, they are part, imparting worldly values. And if we, we are not careful, our carnal man gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's why it's so imperative that we feed our spirit man daily. Not just once a week or once a month, but we need to feed them daily. Because our carnal man is being fed 24-7 and we need to feed the spirit man. In fact, you know that our carnal man, you don't have to do anything, it also gets fatter and fatter and fatter. It's like that. Even if you are lazy and you do nothing, laziness will also feed our carnal man. Because our carnal man loves to be lazy. You know, and so, you know our carnal man is like a fat. You know, fat in the body. For you ladies, you can identify, right? You do nothing. You starve, you don't eat, the fat still grows and grows and grows, correct? That's our carnal man. You do nothing and it still grows more and more and more and more. 
But our spirit man is like a muscle. You have to exercise. You have to train it. If you don't exercise and you don't train it, it will degenerate and it will be useless. Likewise, friends, you need to do your devotions daily. You need to spend time with the Word of God daily in order to exercise our spirit man so that our spirit man will be strong enough to face the carnal man, to challenge the carnal man. But the problem with us, many of us today, we like get quick schemes. We don't like to go through the grind. We like easy ways. That's why you talk about weight loss programs. They're so popular. Take, drink this for two weeks and you will lose 20 pounds. And we love that. We love those type of things. You know? We want quick solutions. That I just drink this, I just, do, I just do this program, diet program for two weeks and I will be a slim. I get a Barbie figure already straight away. And we think, we, we, we want that. We like that. But in reality, when it comes to the spirit man, there's nothing we, we can't avoid training the spirit man. We can't avoid investing into it. We can't avoid feeding the spirit man. And there's none other than doing our daily devotions. And we need to fill our spirit man with the daily devotion. And how do we do our daily devotions? And that's where, you know, like I say, one of our pledges is that we want our members to all do our quiet time regularly. And for that, as a church, we have come up with a plan, a, a, a plan to guide you and to help you in doing your devotions, to encourage all of us, each and every one of us, to do our devotions. You know, your father can't do it for you, your wife can't do it for you, you have to do your own devotions to feed your own spirit man. And so to do that, we have come up with a tool which we call, uh, which we call journaling. And we've come up with this journal, see Wesley Methodist Church Malacca, My Daily Conversations with God. It's a journal for you to use as a tool to help you to do your quiet time, to help you to be disciplined in doing your daily devotions. And we know it's not easy to start. And so, you know, we are selling this to all of you for three ringgit. All right, very cheap. Three ringgit, and there's 60 pages here, so it should last you two months. If you do your devotions daily, it should be a two months worth of devotions. And we start small, okay? We're not going to give you a, a whole year's worth. Let's start small. Let's do start doing our devotions regularly for 60 days, for two months. And to help you, we even have a step-by-step, -step, I mean, a reading plan. We have a reading plan here for you to tell you what to read every day. And we've chosen scriptures that are easy for you to understand. For those of you especially who have never done journaling, you've never done devotion, you've never read the Word of God, we've given you easy scriptures for you to go and look through, to read, and to glean from the Word of God. And not only that, when you, if you... Like I say, for three ringgit, you also get this, a step-by-step -step guide on how to do devotion. We have a step-by-step -step guide here to teach you how to do. And not only that, there is a sample pages of how you're to do your journaling. And we even have a frequently asked questions at the last page. For you, you get your, any questions that you have about journaling. And here's the best part. We're going to encourage all of us to do our journaling. And so like I said, we're going to, this is three ringgit. All of you, please get one before you leave the church today in front of Ranger Hall. Uh, there will be a table there, we'll be selling this. Go and get one and start doing your journaling. And when you completed 60 days of your journaling, 60 days, it doesn't have to be in two months. You miss a few, it's okay. But when you have completed 60 days, then you come back and you show us 60 days completed, we'll sell you the second book for one ringgit only. <laughs> All right? And so this is just to get, you see, we just want to get everyone to start doing their devotions because it's that important and that's why we are doing all these gimmicks all these things it's just tools to help us to get into the mode to encourage us to do our devotions and so we encourage all of you to get one to get the devotion to get the journal so that you can start be serious about your devotions and start doing start recording your devotions down sometimes when we have a record we tend to do it better rather than just flimsy here and nothing when we have a system we have a routine we tend to do things better and so what is this three r that i'm talking about well this is basically the journal that we are introducing is based on like i say it's based on a three r system and what is a three r system well firstly you see your journal will be divided into three parts there'll be read the first r is read the second R is reflect, and the third R is respond. And so the first R, read, what do you do? Well, firstly, you take out the reading plan that we have, and you read. You read what the passage they gave you there, you read. And as you read the passage, as you read and you read and you read, then you'll come across a verse or a phrase or a paragraph that strikes you. And somehow it tingles, it tingles your heart, it gives a tuck in your heart. And you stop that. You note down that verse. Then you write it down under the word here, read. You write down that verse or that phrase or that paragraph. And then what you do after this, you reflect on that verse. 
You reflect on that verse. What is God speaking to me? Why did this verse steal my heart? Why did this verse make me feel uneasy? And so you reflect on it. What is God saying to me through this verse? Is there something He's warning me? Is He trying to tell me something? Is there something that He's, he's promising me about? So you reflect on it. You meditate on it. And then after that, finally, the most important part is respond. You write down your response. You write down, what should, how should I respond to what God has said to me, to what I've reflected? Maybe I should stop doing something. Maybe I, there's some things in my life I must start doing. Maybe there's some things that I should change in my life. And you write down your response. Or it could be a prayer that you make to God. And you write it down in your response. You know? And for some of us, you know, we, will, we will do this and we will come to a passage, we read, and God says, love your enemies. And they say, okay, I need to love my enemies. And the reflection is you reflect on it. Okay, there are people, I, I need to love my enemies. I need to be kind to them. I need to pray for them. And the response is, I need to love my mother-in-law. <laughs> okay? And so there's that. And that will be your response. And you write it down. And what happens is, after two weeks, you look back at your journal and you say, oh, on this date, I promised God I'm supposed to love my mother-in-law. I still haven't loved her yet. Then you know this is something you have yet to do. And so this journal becomes a record of your, of your journey with God. It becomes a record of the things that God speaks to you and the things that you are trying to change and learn in your lives. And so we encourage all of you to get on board this journaling program. Start doing your daily devotions. I say, this is a tool to help us. Don't buy it and keep it in the shelf. Buy it and start doing your devotions. And in fact, I encourage, if you are in a family, you can do it as a family together, you know. Devotions doesn't mean you have to do it all by yourself alone. You can even do it as a family. Husband and wife, parents and children. What you do is that if you have a family, you want to do it together, you gather the family, set a time. Either before you sleep or at the breakfast table, you know, set a time. Half an hour, one hour, just set aside a time. Every night, gather together. What you do as a family is, first 10-15 minutes, everybody read the passage together, read it out loud together as a family or read it quietly. The next 10-15 minutes, quiet, don't talk. Everybody reflect and meditate and journal what God is saying to you. The last 10-15 minutes then, you all share with one another as a family what God has spoken to you and you pray for each other as a family. And this becomes a family altar. And friends, you see, not only will you start feeding your spirit man, your spirit man becomes stronger, but your family will also draw closer together as they spend time with God together. And so I encourage you, friends, get the journal and get this journal, finish it, and we'll see who gets the $1 first, who finishes it first. All right? Praise the Lord for that. Okay, and so uh, before we close, there's one last point that I need to mention here is this, that in order to cultivate a spiritual uh, habit of devotions and doing your journaling, you need to write the last point, be unkind to your feelings. Be unkind to your feelings. You see, friends, one of the problems is that we wake up in the morning and we just don't feel like praying. We just don't feel like reading God's Word. We just don't feel like doing our devotions. And we live in a society today that actually tells us it's okay. You know, a society, we have counsellors that teach us if you don't feel good about it, don't do it. You know, and yes, okay, it's good advice for certain things in life. But when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to our devotions, we can't be based on feelings alone. Because friends, if, you know, you, you just follow your feelings, your feeling changes. Your feeling goes up and down. And there are certain things that you can't wait until you feel good about Then only you do. It's some things you need to start doing and then you will feel good about it afterwards. You know? Some people, they wait till they feel good before they do something. Some people, when they do it, then they feel good about it afterwards. And the same thing is when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, I, I'll tell you honestly, it's not every Sunday I feel like coming up here and preach three sermons a day. You know, I don't feel like doing it every week. It's not every day that I wake up in the morning and I feel like doing my journaling or doing my devotions. But when I break through that feeling of not wanting to, and I actually do it, and I actually stand up here and I preach three sermons a day, after that what happens is you feel great about it. You feel good about it after you have done it. When I break through that feeling of not wanting to read God's Word, and after I've read God's Word and spent time with God's Word and allowed God's Spirit to speak to me, I feel great about it after that. And so friends, you know, you have to decide in your life, do you want to let your life follow your emotions? 
which is subject to the carnal man, which goes up and down, which changes every five seconds? Or will you want to subject your life to the Spirit and to the Word of God, which is the Word of the Spirit, which is constant all the time? You want your life to go up and down, up and down, or you want your life to be a constant all the time? Because that's what emotions does. You know, our emotions goes up and down every moment. One day the husband will look at the wife and say, Whoa, honey, you are hot. The next day you are not. A wife will look at the husband and say, Oh, you are my hero. The next day you are my zero. Our emotions goes up and down every day. It changes. It fluctuates. And we can't depend on emotions. You can't depend on feelings when it comes to things of the Spirit because the flesh doesn't want you to feed the Spirit. The flesh will rebel every step of the way. The flesh will say, no, you don't need to, you mustn't, you shouldn't. Because the flesh knows that when the Spirit man is strong, he is dead. He is out of the picture. He is out of the equation. And so he will do everything. Every step of the way, your flesh will rebel. It will be a lifetime of struggle. It will be a lifetime of putting the flesh in its place. But when we make our spirit man strong, and we sow to the spirit, the struggle becomes easier and easier each day. I just want to close with this verse. Galatians 6, 7, it reminds us, it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mock. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. If you want to continue living your life sowing to the flesh, feeding your carnal man, the end result will be corruption and death. But if you want to live your life, if you sow to the Spirit, the end result will be black God's blessings. And for some of us here right now, if we think that we are spiritual, if we think that, you know, it's fine for me, just coming to church once a week or once a month and hear God's word, I'm fine, I'm strong enough. Let me remind you what 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stand, take heed, lest he falls. When the times of take heed, if you think you're strong, if you think you have a very strong spirit man, take heed, lest when the trials come, when testing comes, when temptation comes, you find that your spirit man was not prepared at all and you just fall into the ways of the flesh. You know, the French army in World War II, they were considered the best army in the world at that time, in the beginning of World War II. They were considered the best army in the world. It took Hitler only less than two months to overrun France because they thought they were prepared. The generals, the French generals thought they had the best army. They thought they were strong. They thought they were prepared. But in reality, when times changed, when the real testing came, they were not modernized enough. They were not disciplined enough. They were not prepared enough. As a result, the best army in the world fell in less than two months. Likewise, friends, if you think you're strong, take heed lest you fall. But instead, if we sow to the Spirit, he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Let us stand to our feet as we close. Let us pray. Let's stand to our feet. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God, Lord, we just give you all the praise, all the honor and all the glory. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we ask, Lord, this morning that you help us, Lord, to see the importance of strengthening our spirit, man. Help us to realize, Lord, that we can't continue living sowing to the flesh, strengthening the carnal man, but we need to start strengthening our spirit, man. Lord, give us that desire Give us that awakening. Give us the conviction. And help us, Lord, every step of the way. As we take this journey with you, help us, Lord, to sow to our spirit, man. Lord, I just commit each and every one of my brothers and sisters unto your hands. May you draw us close to you. May you draw us closer to you, to your heart. Amen.